again to Off the Page. I'm Leslie Choice. My guest today is James Gimeon, and he's one of the translators of a 2,300-year-old text called The Art of War. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Leslie. And it's good to have you here. Now, we're talking about an author who was alive perhaps 2,300 years ago. Tell us about Sun Tzu. Uh, Sun Tzu lived at the time of Confucius. Uh, this was around the 6th century BC, and I should say, um, as far as we're able to tell, because uh, it it's, uh, comes to us from such a, a distant past that the records aren't really clear about whether such a person actually existed. Uh, but as the lore has it, uh, this was during the uh, time of what's called the Warring States period in, in China, a very difficult, very chaotic time, great transition. And it was characterized by these uh, warring states, each vying to increase their territory and increase their kingdom at the expense of their, their rivals and neighbors. And so it was a, a time of constant warfare. And during this time, this great figure emerged who uh, developed a reputation for an unusual and extremely successful way of, of, of uh, serving at the, at the pleasure of the kings of the warring states and obtaining a victory over the neighbors. And so the, the book is actually a, it's, it's a book of advice to, to That's the a book of experience. Mm -hmm. It's experience and how it was that this particular unique strategic view took root. Uh, and and uh, what was interesting about the time is that because the goal of the Warring States was to expand their territory, they were interested in uh, preserving the land and the farms and the people in the neighboring states, supposedly their enemies. And so the unique uh, perspective uh, of the strategy that, that Sun Tzu uh, developed was how to attain the victory without going to battle and without obliterating the enemy, thereby enlarging his king's area without, without destruction. And that's the core of the message that has gone down for the last 2,600 years, certainly as a, as a key strategic text in China and throughout Asia. And now in the last 30 or 40 years, having that same impact in all facets of our society in the West. Certainly a book with longevity. Now, it appears in your volume as a poem, which to the in a 21st century mind here seems a little bit odd because we're talking about a poem about military strategy. Well, it, that's a very interesting point. And I think I'd have to tell you something about how the text came to us uh, to explain why it appears that way. Uh, in, the, in the days of the Sun Tzu, uh, it was uh, before books were invented. And the first couple hundred years, this great wisdom was passed on from this historical figure to successive generals by an oral lineage of people that uh, just heard it spoken and had to remember it and understand it in order to pass it on to the next generation. And it was only hundreds of years later that it was written on these, uh, the first form of books in China, which are these short bamboo um, uh, uh, sticks almost, about that long, where four or five Chinese characters would be, would be written, and this would be, uh, these would be strung together by a bamboo thong, and people would carry and transport those. And those um, um, were the way that the, this lore went on after the oral lineage. Um, in order for the wisdom and the insights of Sun Tzu to be uh, absorbed and memorized, the message was put down in very short, aphoristic kinds of sentences, uh, oftentimes uh, made up of a subject, a verb, and an object. This is this. And the poetry and much of it rhyming in the original was the vehicle by which almost all of the oral lineages were possible to, to be transmitted over time. So while there wasn't exactly a notion of poetry as we might know it now, that form made it possible for people to hear, hearing the message to listen, it was almost like a song. Yes. They could listen, they could absorb it, and it, it enabled this, this, uh, this strategic view uh, that he had developed to be transmitted to successive generals and to reach us. Uh, and this is, in, in fact, one of the key ways in which our translation is distinguished from 
the many other translations, some of them quite excellent, uh, very inspiring to the members of the Denma Translation Group, um, in the way that we, tr we try as much as we can to preserve that original feeling and tone and cadence yes. that was part of the original in uh, the language message, when you take in it the language the itself. Many of the other translations, because the Chinese is so difficult, will paraphrase, adding uh, many words and, and, in fact, whole sentences to describe these potent ideas. Uh, and we felt that oftentimes this entered something completely different. Yes. Um, and we worked very hard in the translation process to find English words that would preserve that, that quality and thereby the modern day reader would be um, experiencing that whole sense of transmission from the original Chinese that Chinese people 2,000 years ago did. Okay. And by doing that, uh, enable the modern reader to have a, a more genuine connection to the text from the inside out rather mm -hmm. than just regarding it as an academic or archaeological find from a foreign culture. Yeah. And so if someone's going to use it in their life, uh, that becomes a, a more helpful way of approaching the text. And so that gets us to people are going to read it today who aren't necessarily wanting to learn about war. It's a book about strategies, right. but you also say it's, uh, it's a book about pacifism as well, which seems like a bit do of we a say paradox that? to me. Do we, in, in the book, do we say that? Maybe that's your reviewers. That's why. I think maybe okay. one of the reviewers would have well, said that. Well, tell me about yeah. that. Is that correct? Well, Is there the, a pacifist element to it? Uh, the, <clears throat> the core message uh, of the book, it, it starts with the view that conflict is an inevitable part of human life. Um, in the sense that, uh, not just in the sense of battle, but that, um, th that whatever you undertake will inevitably have to deal with um, obstacle, friction, resistance. And so uh, the corollary to that is that, in fact, leadership is also a fact of human existence. And that is, each one of us is the center of our world. And we will have, inevitably, a vision or an objective that we're attempting to carry out, which others in our world will not immediately see or agree with. And our goal will be to bring others along with us in, the, in that objective. And so while the Sun Tzu articulates this wonderful wisdom about how to do that without going to battle in a strictly speaking military text, the wisdom of it speaks to any situation where those same conditions apply. So each one of us um, has those conditions in whatever we undertake. Is it possible to conquer without aggression? Yes. And um, I think one of the things that also distinguishes our, our um, our book, our translation from other editions is we don't view the text as solely a uh, translation from a distant culture and a long ago time, but a wonderful articulation of a commonly held human understanding. So that, in fact, this is the kind of experience that people have or sense that they are able to do in ordinary circumstances. What the book allows is uh, a very wonderfully articulated and rich uh, strategic view that helps you uh, understand better how you can do that in your life. Yes. Now the author refers to something called sure. Right. What is that? Sure. Um, well, to explain sure, I think I, I should uh, take a step back and talk about the, the, the basic view of the text. Um, you know, it used to be in the, in the West that we um, saw our world as um, made up of separate entities that may or may not come into contact with each other. Uh, but with the uh, discoveries mostly from the scientific realm over the last 30 or 40 years, uh, there's been a big change in the West. And that is that we now view our world as more of an interconnected web of things. Um, we read about this land, this massive water off of the coast of uh, South America and its temperature affects our weather patterns. Uh, we, we experience the internet as a reality in our network of friends. And this interconnected web of things is constantly changing. Uh, and the book is a wonderful leadership guide on how to work with the challenges that come up that, with, with that kind of reality. So that's why the, bu the book is very popular right now in the West, because we have the same world view, that being that the world is interconnected, that the Chinese had at the time that they wrote the book. So now we can kind of fit into the view. So that being the view, 
Uh, what Schur talks about is how um, both the configuration of entities or energies in the world and the power within them can be um, used to one's advantage in carrying forth any campaign or objective. So sometimes things are working in your favor just because of other forces in the world. Sometimes things are working against you. I, I right. gather that maybe That's when things right. are working against you, you kind of hold back. That's right. Don't put too much energy out there. When, there, when things are lining up in a good way for you, uh, and it may not have been anything that you personally caused, but That's those right. good things are happening. You you use that energy, you feed off it, or That's you fit right. into it, or what would you do? I think those are two of probably the most profound lessons that have made impact on the West. And the first part of that is when things are working against you to, to not move forward. Yes. Uh, the example most often given uh, in the second and third chapters of the Sunzu is the devastating effects of attempting to go forward into a campaign or going to battle when those factors are against you. Yeah. And that the only good that comes from that, at the best, is a stalemate. And most often worse is the devastation. And at that time, absolutely right, it's in the words in, of, of, the, of the art of war, it's better not to go forward. And this has a lot to do with uh, when he's speaking about military things. Uh, what's a good leader and what's a bad leader? Right. Uh, the bad leader might go forward because of, of arrogance or even courage or something else. The That's good right. leader is thinking about what else is happening in the world, not just with his army, maybe, that's but with right. the opposing all army, of or those, the weather. All of those myriad mm -hmm. details, absolutely. And that's, to get back to your question about Schur, um, the, 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 the leader, the person that we aspire to be, what we call in the books the sage commander, is in touch with all the details that make up the situation. And while Schur isn't something that you can manufacture, by being in touch with all the elements of whatever campaign you're undertaking, you can know the moment when those factors are aligned in your favor. And at that time, the smallest gesture can have such more profound effect and a positive effect on your behalf than all of the struggle when, when things aren't in your favor. And the, the wonderful example in the book is uh, the example of trees and rocks. It talks about that a big boulder, when sitting uh, still in the top of a mountain, has no momentum and no particular power. But with a small nudge, it can roll down the mountain, and then it's virtually unstoppable. And that's uh, one of the images of uh, Schur. Mm -hmm. uh, the author there and your translation says, use the extraordinary to attain victory. Mm. What, what kind of extraordinary measures might you refer to? The unexpected? Largely the unexpected. Um, this, again, is one of the, the pairs of, of um, um, in, in the Sunzu that are, that are very, very popular in, in readers of the West. It's the orthodox and the extraordinary. Uh, these are not two particular things, but it says use the orthodox to engage, use the extraordinary to attain victory. The notion here is that speed and unexpected movement is the greatest asset in obtaining um, your objective. So the, ob the, the orthodox is always only what the other person expects. What it is at any moment can be anything. And the extraordinary is always only what they would never expect. Right. So those, those are completely, the content of what those are is uh, completely interchangeable. The, the lesson for the art of war is, can the leader be flexible enough in touch with all those changing elements of that interconnected world so that you know at any moment what is the expected and what is the extraordinary. I also noticed that he's not opposed to the idea of retreat. Absolutely not. That's a great wisdom. When at those does times when those one retreat? If we move away from the military context and sort of bring it back into our century, when does one retreat? I think the, the, uh, the time when one retreats is, by, 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 is known by realizing that there's a difference between winning versus losing and what we call victory. If you're concerned about winning, it often means that there has to be somebody else who's losing. And at that, uh, that leads to, to just fighting at any cost to obtain winning. But that's like losing the, the, uh, the war by trying to win the battle. Yeah. So if you're concerned about victory, which is the end result uh, of your campaign, it's best oftentimes not to get in, uh, enmeshed in a particular battle that might drain your resources, might take you away from the core of your objective. Things that are, uh, mistakes that are often made, whether it's in business or 
uh, in any one of the applications that the art of war talks about. What about uh, working with chaos? He talks about chaos. It's not the enemy either, is it? No, not at all. Um, once you have the view that the world is made up of an interconnected web of, uh, of things that are constantly changing, um, it's not very difficult to see that um, what we often understand as chaos is simply the fact that things aren't how we want them at one particular time. And oftentimes what we experience as chaos is uh, by viewing the battleground so far, the campaign, in too small an arena or having too small a view. So oftentimes, uh, very practically speaking, what looks like chaos on one level is if you broaden your view is um, not chaos at all and can be your ally. And that sounds like good advice to me. I'm going to hang on to that thought. We're going to take a short break right now. We'll be back with uh, James Gimian right after this. back to Off the Page. My guest today is James Gimian. We're talking about The Art of War, a book written some 2,300 years ago. Uh, Sun Tzu, the author here, he speaks a lot about supplies. And I found that really kind of interesting. You know, as we talk about military strategies and sort of winning and losing and all the various forces, he keeps coming back to this thing about supplies. Why are supplies important? Um, the um, most important thing for whether it's a mili military commander or a leader of, of any uh, campaign, is to not lose the big objective by ignoring the small details. And in this case, uh, supplies are the basic sustenance of, of your army, so to speak, uh, the basic care of those who are working along with you in whatever your campaign or objective uh, might be. And we see oftentimes that people get so caught up in the big drama of the campaign that they uh, lose sight of the little things that one can do uh, for members of your family or members of your company, um, if it's a, you know, in business, that will sustain them and strengthen them and allow them to be a um, you know, more productive member of your team. So supplies is one of those little details that makes up. It's, it's what the, the big picture is made up of. And you can't yeah. get to the, the, the great victory without the the small details. And, and it's interesting too how often uh, the author comes back to uh, references to natural forces. And this is a very significant element of his advice and of his story. And you know when I read in the text and he reminds me that water will run downhill, I'm thinking everybody knows that. What's the point here? Because there is a kind of an interesting point behind that that we do forget along the way. Well, yes. I think it goes back to that change in worldview that I talked <coughs> about earlier. Um, if you think the world is a uh, separate um, things, you, as we have in Western civilization for quite a long time, think that you have power over it and that you can you can uh, shape it and move it and change it to be something that that um, you want it to be, the fulfillment of your objective. As we're seeing now, whether we're talking about the natural world uh, in ecology and biology, and I think more and more in social systems. Um, Everything being connected, meaning anything that you do to affect one part of it affects every other part of it. Um, so you have to take that into account in terms of how you yeah. make any step at all. Yeah. What about business people? Uh, I'm told that business people would pick up your book and read it and uh, apply some of these strategies to the way that they run their operation. That's right. It's <coughs> probably the, the, um, the most well-known uh, m market or group of people interested uh, in the last 30 years, particularly in the West, and I know businessmen and women who will virtually run their businesses using the, the art of war as a Bible. Can you give me sort of some an example, like what yes. kind of a problem would come up? Or well, move uh, in, the in the later chapters, for example, mm -hmm. chapters 9 and 10, it talks about um, <coughs> the various natures of the ground. Now, in the first chapter, it talks about the three important things that a leader needs to know. Um, and it talks in earlier translations about the weather and the terrain and the general's abilities. Uh, and that's a strictly speaking military context. 
When we started our translation, one of the great discoveries for us, the great moments of aha, was learning that those Chinese words translated much more broadly than weather and terrain. The word for weather actually meant heaven, and the word for terrain actually meant earth. So this was another clue that this could be more broadly applied, that heaven meant your vision, your, your goals. Uh, earth meant the ground and the practicalities of any terrain. And the general's goal is obviously how do you obtain your objective in the face of that, the, the, the earth, the practicalities. In chapters 9 and 10, um, the Sunza talks about the nine grounds, and it articulates the different kinds of practical situations that you might find yourself in, and gives very practical advice about whether it's a time to engage, to be protected, to take the high ground, to retreat. And these, like all the rest of the text, can be seen as, strictly speaking, military yes. advice, or advice that relates to any one of us when facing the different kinds of practical grounds mm. that, our, that our endeavors might go through. Mm. Or if it's a time of growth in the economy, of, or retreat in the economy, or any of those other variables, I guess those are some of the things that he would factor in there. Right. What does one do once the battle is won, if you're the victor? I think the, the most important thing is to realize that we're not talking about some kind of finite um, moment. But as we talk about victory, it's something that's ongoing. Um, the old notion of winning versus losing often meant that there was a, a residue, uh, meaning if you won, you, you, you conquered somebody, you, you, you did destruction in the process, you went to battle. It meant that uh, there was repercussions. There was a hardening in the hearts of the, the people that were once your enemies and might in the future be your friends. And so then in the next campaign, you had to take all of that into account. The notion of victory, in this sense, is realizing that that moment recurs all the time, that those people that at one point are your opposition or your competitors could easily next week be your, your greatest allies. And so you have to take a different perspective. It isn't, it isn't over. It just begins anew, and you constantly go forward. And as we know from history, the, the battle that is won may turn out to be something that leads to a much greater defeat That's right. uh, down the road. Are these some principles that can be applied globally in the big picture, this art of war to ultimately preventing war? Certainly, we feel that, as we say in the introduction, the principles at the core of the art of war can apply from the level of what we call the battle of ego, someone working with the nature of their own mind, to the level of global politics and warfare. Because the principles are basic human principles that apply to anybody who has senses and interacts with the world. And we see so often examples, whether it's, as we, we talk about in the book, a, a, a woman, a mother putting her teenage uh, son or daughter to bed and the kind of conflict that comes up there, or a workplace situation, or a market share that some company is trying to take, or the same principles applying in battles within and between nation states in the world today. Yes, and we're going to take a short break and we'll be back right after this. has been James Gimmion. We've been talking about the art of war. Uh, Jim, do you think that the art of war, the man who created it at least, could have envisioned that it would have been used uh, these many centuries later? You know, that's a funny question. I often wonder what that would be like. Um, I think when you get to, be so get to something that's um, true in so many applications, that the wisdom that allowed the Sun Tzu to, to proclaim this great strategic view in war he had to know that it applied to just about everything. Yeah. So I imagine Maybe. he might have. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for being on the show. Sure. Thank you. And I thank you for watching Off the Page. Uh, I'll see you again next time. Mm -hmm.